All right, welcome to today's Houston Business Leaders Forum virtual panel. Today's topic is navigating uncertainty. And we've got a great group of panelists today, um, some of Houston's top business leaders. I'm your moderator, Stephen Brent May, founder of One Foot Over. We're a digital marketing agency that works with B2B clients to help align sales and marketing, especially for customers with longer sales cycles. So a few things before we get started with today's webinar. If you, uh, if you have questions for our panelists, um, in the questions pane, please uh, enter your questions there. And once we get through the first portion, uh, we'll get to some of those questions. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please list their name. Anything that we don't get to on the call today, um, they've graciously agreed to follow up afterward to answer these questions. There will also be a follow-up survey that will be sent out um, after today's panel. If you could take the time to please answer that survey, it provides valuable information to help with programming moving forward. And the best part, you'll be entered into a drawing for, um, for a bottle of wine. So I want to get us started today. We've got Chris Fisher from HRMP. He's the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Deborah Sofer, the founder of Strategic Financial Services and Strategic Benefits Solution. We also have Brian Gregory, President of Aldridge, Elaine Howard, shareholder Andrews Myers and Ross Schoolsby, the director of financial operations for Bridgepoint Consulting. Uh, so to frame it and give us some context about the information you'll be getting today, I just want to give the panelists a, a moment to introduce themselves, their business, and, and you know to share a little bit about how they can help benefit you in the future. So I'll kick it over to Elaine to get us started. Great. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, and I'm glad uh, everybody's been able to jump on our call with us. These are certainly uncertain times. My name is Elaine Howard. I'm uh, an employment lawyer. I also have a practice in uh, general litigation, including uh, business litigation and construction litigation. My law firm is Andrews Myers. We uh, uh, emphasize construction litigation, but our practice is a full service law firm with uh, offices in Houston and Austin. And we have been actively working. I have been actively working with clients over those last 12 weeks in this time of crisis, helping them figure out and strategize about return to the office, handling COVID, and navigating these uncertain times. Thanks, Elaine. And Ross, tell us a little bit about yourself in Bridgepoint Consulting. Thanks, Stephen. My name is Ross Goolsby. I'm a director with Bridgepoint Consulting. I co-head the Houston office. We have offices in Austin, Houston, and Dallas. Uh, we're opening Denver in the fall, and we're going to continue our expansion nationwide uh, in, in the future years and, and hope to be a nationwide, uh, have a nationwide geographic footprint in the next uh, five years or so. Uh, we offer a broad range of finance accounting and technology, uh, as well as risk and compliance services that support clients from startup through growth phases all the way to IPO readiness and beyond. Uh, we essentially help executives and management teams reduce operational and business risks, bridge resource gaps, and improve all overall performance. Um, you know, through this you know, COVID-19 period, we've obviously spent a lot of time with clients uh, navigating some uncertainty in, in finance and IT, and, and I look forward to participating in the panel and, and, and excited to be part of the group. Thank you. Great, thanks Ross. Chris. Yeah, Chris Fisher uh, with HRMP. Uh, we are a comprehensive administrative company. We support employer groups uh, with human resources, payroll, benefits administration, and compliance. Uh, we primarily work with organizations that have either originated or have headquarters in a major metropolitan area in Texas, but we service clients in all 50 states. Um, so. We've, we've been kind of on the front lines working with our clients and understanding how to respond to the immediate threat uh, of COVID, the impact of that to their business and to their employees, uh, as well as uh, how to navigate or circumnavigate uh, the legislation, uh, the PPP lending process, uh, and then supporting them long-term to make sure that their organizations are, are well fortified uh, moving forward, that their employees' uh, wellness is, is well taken care of, uh, and ultimately being that um, uh, you know, a, a additional guiding light for them uh, as they kind of navigate uh, today's environment. Great. 
And Deborah, I, when I introduced you, I mentioned that you're the founder of two companies. Um, for today's conversation, you're going to be focusing more on the financial side. So if you want to tell us a little about that. My pleasure. Uh, Strategic Financial Services is a holistic financial planning firm. We work with professionals um, in all capacities, uh, couples and singles who are interested in pre building the foundation for their future by looking at every component, each module of a financial plan. We triage our work with professionals who um, are among these modules. So we work with attorneys helping the clients in a way by being catalysts and informative on how they can structure their wills and issues they need to be considering when they visit with their attorneys, working with their CPAs so that they can make sure that we're all on the same page, looking at their life in a holistic fashion. And then we help them analyze their risk management and their investments so that there's an integrated process and an opportunity to think tax efficiently as well as futuristically for the best and the worst of circumstances that can happen. Hopefully it's always the best, but we need to plan for each end of the continuum. Perfect, thanks, Deborah. And finally, Brian. Thanks, <clears throat> my name is Brian Gregory. I'm the president of Aldridge. So we provide IT outsourcing services to small and medium-sized businesses. We've got offices in Houston, Austin, Dallas, and Seattle, Washington. And as you can imagine, we've had a busy two months. So leading up to this, we've worked with our clients to make sure that they're thinking about IT in a strategic fashion and planning for disasters and so that their businesses can continue. But none of us really thought through exactly how this would go down. Um, so we've, we've, we've reacted well through this and happy to say our clients have fared well for the most part, um, but just helping our clients navigate through the transition to all of their employees working remotely um, in home offices that they weren't really thinking through. Um, so we, our help desk really helped them manage through that. And so now just keeping a focus on the future as to what, what do we plan for if the next wave comes or what's the next disaster that we need to make sure that our businesses are ready for is what our, our focus is with our clients. Great. So what, we, what we've essentially heard through these introductions is that we have a wide breadth of experience and um, opportunities to learn here, and we've got some of the top talent. So let's jump right in. Chris, I want to start with you. Um, thinking about now that employees are starting to come back to work and coming back to the office, what are some things that employers need to keep in mind when it comes to the health and safety of their employees? Um, yeah, thanks, Stephen. I I'll take kind of a tactical approach to that because uh, obviously we've we've learned a lot about our organizations and about our people, and we're taking some of those lessons and we're mixing them together with state and local and or CDC guidelines, and we're we're trying to all build a, a plan to to get back to the office. And you know, some of the folks on this call may already have strategies in place, but but we are actually hearing from companies on a day-to-day -day basis that are still struggling to kind of formalize those plans uh, or their plans keep changing. Um, so I, I say from a tactical perspective, some things that uh, should be considered is obviously preparing your facilities, um, you know, adequate cleaning supplies and uh, new cleaning regimens. I mean, we have hand sanitizers all over the, the, the building. Uh, and we're also making sure that we're posting instructions uh, around the facilities uh, for proper conduct. Uh, we've, we've already limited traffic in our offices and we're encouraging uh, some of our clients to, to take a measured approach when it comes to uh, kind of opening back up their offices. Uh, you know, a good example of that is just preparation of, of conference rooms, limiting large groups. I had somebody say the other day they feel like a restaurant because they've they've removed half of their their seating capacity and and their shared workspaces. Uh, but we're also seeing the rise of uh, more remote meetings, and I I know of a couple clients that had remote meetings with people that are you know a few offices away from one another. So. I, I would think that that would be weird, but it's really not. It's kind of the the new normal that people are still trying to, you know, uh, socially distance. Um, but you know, continued limitations 
uh, on traffic, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, 50-50 uh, splits of employee populations or alternating days to mitigate risk. Uh, we're also seeing groups that have just redefined what normal office hours are. Um, you know, instituting maybe like a three to 11 shift, that does a lot for your employees that need to be home during the day because of, you know, the impact with their kids or whatnot. And maybe their work doesn't need to be done through, you know, a typical eight to five, um, you know, schedule that allows them to, to, to still be in the office and limit a, a lot of, uh, you know, traffic. Uh, one of the other things that we're really encouraging folks to do is update your policies, right? There's been a lot of information that they may have sent out to all of your employees and whatnot, but you need to make sure hard and fast that your policies, your procedures, your employee handbooks, and more importantly, the acknowledgement by your employees so that people know, you know, what our strategy is uh, moving forward. Um, I am not personally endorsing this, but we are talking with clients who are considering offering antibody testing uh, at their office. I think that that comes with a little bit of a pro and a con, right? There may be a level of assurance or that may give confidence to folks to return to the office, but we're human also. And there may be some kind of underlying stigma that, oh my God, you've had this the whole time. And um, so, you know, I, I would take a measured approach with that. Um, we're also seeing the rise in, in confirmed cases uh, here, in, here in Texas. So what I would recommend organizations do is don't file away your preparedness plan and keep that top of mind, keep it on your desk because, you know, uh, you, know you, you, you kind of hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I, I think that that should be readily available to you. And um, communication, uh, no inform your employees about what the trigger events are and what plans will be deployed. And that's going to cut down on a lot of the fire drills that you may have. And then lastly, I would say, seek advice. It's okay to look to third parties like an HRMP or even my colleague, Elaine Howard at Andrew Myers. Uh, it's important that you get uh, some, some additional perspective and different eyes on what may work for your company. Great. And Elaine, can you share, you know, a legal perspective on this topic? Absolutely. I, I second what Chris said. I, I think particularly in terms of a return to work plan, the probably the most important thing from a legal perspective is to actually have a plan. Um, and so, you know, a lot, I think there's a lot of ad hoc, a lot of, well, there's a lot of things that are changing as well. And as things change, you do need to be somewhat flexible. I want to sort of leapfrog off of what Chris said, because what Chris's focus was how to get people back into the office. What's going to start happening more and more as more people come into the office is you're going to have employees who are reporting either COVID symptoms, which are very, very common symptoms, normal to people including headaches and coughs and sore throats that happen regularly. Um, and you're going to have more and more people in the workplace that actually have a positive COVID diagnosis. So what I'm seeing is a lot of people that have the return to the office plan fairly well laid out, but don't have a really solid or written or communicated plan on what do I do with people who are reporting symptoms? How serious are the symptoms? I mean, all of us cough once in a while. So Brian coughed two times before we uh, got onto this call. And so I don't know if he's gonna plan to quarantine or not, my guess would be not. So what what is your plan? What are you telling your supervisors? What are your supervisors and your HR telling your employees? Because you all need to be on the same page of what to do. What do you do if you get a call, if an employee gets a call that they were at a, their mom's house over the weekend and, and now their mom is coughing and has some COVID symptoms? What does that employee do? You're, does everyone know what the protocols are going to be? And again, they've changed a lot. I will say that the most helpful resource that I have come up with, everybody get a pen, I'll wait for just a second, is something that's put out by the Greater Houston Partnership. They have just recently on June 1st, come out with something, hold it up, I'll print it in. It's managing COVID-19 cases in the workplace. And it synthesizes a lot of recommendations from the state 
and from the CDC in how to deal with employees that have symptoms, employees with a COVID diagnosis, and it also has a section on what to do if you have a customer or a vendor or a contractor come in your office that then you get a call two days later that that person also has symptoms or has a COVID diagnosis. And there are recommendations. They vary a little bit, whether you're critical infrastructure, whether you're not critical infrastructure, and what to do with these employees that have symptoms or COVID diagnosis. But there is some flexibility for employers to figure out how much above these minimum guidelines do you want as an employer to implement in your workforce to keep your employees safe? Because a lot of employees are very worried right now. And I think it's important to have this policy to communicate, not only to keep people safe, but to let people know you want to keep them safe um, and to be able to educate people and have everyone on the same page about what the plan is and what to do. Um, one thing I, I wanna also mention that I kind of alluded to with the Greater Houston Partnership document is that as we start to reopen our offices, there's gonna be more and more costs for people to have meetings in your offices. For some of us may have trainings or may have you know, multiple people come for multiple days, depending on what kind of, of work that you do. And so one of the things some employers are starting to do is ask for a release of guests that come to your office. Because with employers, you have some protections through the workers' comp system. Employees, you have some protections through the workers' comp system if they get sick. You don't have that protection through a, a guest or a visitor or a customer. So think through what your exposure is, how much these people who come into your office are able to socially distance or wear masks or take whatever other kind of precautions. But depending on your evaluation of the risk, how long they're gonna be in the office, the circumstances, you may wanna also consider having some sort of release or acknowledgement from these people releasing your company of liability. Great. And so we were talking about people coming back to the office. Um, on the flip side of that, we've also heard that there are some companies out there that have realized they can operate remotely where they may not have thought about that before. Um, when it comes to measuring efficiency or monitoring progress and things with employees working in a new remote situation, Elaine, what are some, some things employers should be looking for? Sure. One of the most important things really as an employment lawyer that I have counseled clients on for years and years and years is document, document, document. Um, if you say an employee didn't do something right and there's no documentary evidence of that or no evidence that you counseled that employee or talked to that employee, it's a he said, she said, and it's harder to prove later if you have a discrimination claim or you want to contest an unemployment claim or you have some other related problem. Um, that's a lot easier in a face-to-face -face kind of environment to counsel people to observe performance issues. You know, one of one of the issues that a lot of companies, a lot of supervisors, a lot of managers have is the assumption, rightly or wrongly, that if you're home, you're kind of mucking around and you're not really very focused. And that's true for some people. It's not true for other people. And so I think it is very important to think through what your metrics are going to be for performance, because they are probably both in terms of the way you measure it and how you measure it are going to have to change if a lot of your workforce is still going to be remote. Um, you need to make sure employees understand deadlines, understand what the performance criteria are, what the goals are. You know, the recommendation is to focus more on output, what the employees are actually accomplishing than necessarily how it's getting done or kind of micromanaging how it's getting done, because it may be getting done at two in the morning. I was just talking to a client yesterday, or I was talking to somebody on this call yesterday who uh, has somebody who often interfaces with the Texas Workforce Commission, Chris, and um, that has become very hard to do between nine and five because they're overwhelmed. And so it makes sense for that person to do the job at very off hours. And that's the most efficient and effective way for that person to do the job, but it's not the way you would normally expect to get that job done. So everyone needs to be on the same page about what the expectations are, what the metrics are. It may be helpful to figure out whether there are some performance tools, some analysis tools. I think Brian's gonna talk through a little bit of some 
specifics on that, but you still have every right, even if people are working from home, to write them up, counsel them, figure out if they're really performing or not. Just because they're a step removed and we're not used to handling this, that that whole kind of disciplinary counseling process becomes much more complicated, much harder. But you certainly, I think, as an employer, have every right to, even if people are hurting and are stressful, to hold them to task and make sure they're doing their job and give them appropriate feedback. And if they can't manage to do their job in these circumstances, to you know, discipline or even you know, make the decision to terminate them if they're not able to perform. So to your point, Elaine, you mentioned you know, the metrics and measuring these things. Um, and Brian absolutely can jump in here and talk about some of the tools. Brian, I'd also like if you could touch on what are some of the things that we may not have paid attention to before or that may be different in a working from home environment that we should be aware of, even from a, a cybersecurity angle? Sure. Yeah, I think to Elaine's point, really making sure that you define what the KPI is that you're going to measure your employees on and, and making sure that you have a system in place and there's a wide variety of applications that are out there that really track the data that um, your employees are entering into the system. We've built a culture in our business that if it's not in the system, it didn't happen. So making sure that every interaction you have with the client, every sales activity you have is, is in the system. And it's one thing to get it in the system, but then getting that data back out in a meaningful fashion. Um, so that if you've got a team of folks that you're managing, you don't want to have to dig in on every little thing to go get the data that you want. You need to present it in a, a dashboard format that you can easily see the productivity of your team, both from a quantity of work, but also the quality of work. So making sure that we're thinking through that balance of I'm measuring my employees' productivity and how efficient they're being at their job, but also the quality of the, the work that they're doing. So how do, how do we measure that and keep that top of mind? From a sales perspective, there's tools like HubSpot and Salesforce that have built-in dashboards and that kind of thing, which is great, but there's many tools that getting that data displayed in a proper fashion is very difficult. And we help clients leverage Power BI and, and things like that to be able to pull the data out of the various systems so that you can see that data in a meaningful fashion. To the second part of your question, really talking to companies and employees that are working from home, some of the things that we've seen them really let their guard down on is, is that security awareness. And so we people when they're in the office and we're preaching cybersecurity at them, they keep it top of mind and they realize that that email coming in that says it's from UPS isn't real and they don't click on the link. But unfortunately, when people are in their home office, they're distracted by lots of things that are going on, they're working on a computer they're not used to working on, they put that guard down a little bit. We actually had a client recently that one of their vendors, the CFO, their email account got compromised. So she fell for a phishing scheme where she accidentally put in her credentials, gave her credentials away, and didn't realize it for about two weeks. So the, the criminal, we'll call him a criminal for this, they wrote along with their email, read all of her emails that were going out, read all of her emails coming in, and realized when she was going to send out invoices. And so when the invoices went out to our client, another email came from the same address saying, hey, make sure you update your records and ACH your money to our new bank account. And our client, letting their guard down, didn't do the call to verify step that they built into their organization. So in a normal fashion, if they would have gotten that information, they would have picked up the phone, called their known client and said, hey, I just got this message that you updated your banking information. Can you please read back that information to me so that I confirm that it's real? They skipped that step. And unfortunately, ACH almost $1 million to a, someone's fake bank or someone else's bank account. Luckily, they snapped to pretty quickly, got the bank involved, and was able to get that money back. Um, but had they wired the money or something like that, it, it could have been gone. And there's nothing from a technology point of view that we could have done to prevent something like that. It was a legit email from a legit source, and they ACH the, the money outside of outside of their system. So, again, making sure that you're you're looking at your policies, you're keeping those top of mind, and then I think also using this time right now to reevaluate how the last three months have gone. 
And if there's things that need to be adjusted, let's, let's use this as an opportunity to get that fixed, to improve the systems that we have in place so that when something happens again in the future, we're, we're better off than we were this go around. Great. And I think kind of shifting the conversation here, um, Brian, you talked about taking a look at the past three months. Um, as a business owner myself, one of the things that I look at is constantly forecasting and budgeting. Um, Ross, if I could get some guidance here from you, this has been an unprecedented situation for a lot of people. And, you know, here in Texas and in Houston specifically, we've seen industries like the energy industry take a, a huge hit. Where do companies go from here in terms of budgeting and forecasting moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say, um, first of all, it depends on, on how your company was impacted by this pandemic. So for this conversation, I think I'll exclude companies that were favorably impacted and are having to adapt to maybe some expanding and new new businesses. And maybe they, they even pivoted and and, and saw some, some, um, some success that way. I'm going to focus on uh, the, the, the companies that have been negatively impacted, I think, by pandemics and, and by the pandemic and, and uh, are, are in a cash crunch or trying to figure out what to do with their capital and, and how, to, how to forecast, how to budget. Um, you know, I, the first thing I would say is um, I'm getting a sense that the trough is behind us uh, in Houston. I, I hope that's the case. I don't want to be overly optimistic, but you know, we have a lot of clients in a lot of different verticals. Some were not impacted uh, to the extent others were impacted. But I think kind of across the board, what I'm hearing is cautious optimism, uh, you know, a new levels of activity coming in. So, you know, with that as the backdrop, I think, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to forecasting and budgeting, I think you continue, you must continue to focus on cash is king. So develop a robust process for a 13 week cash forecast. Uh, make sure that that you are are tightly managing your receivables. Uh, you're on top of your receivables, and you're getting paid uh, timely from your customers. Same thing. You're watching your payables, and maybe you've negotiated some some uh, extended terms with vendors, and so you really have a good handle on your cash flow, and you're watching it every week. Uh, you know, I think I think the pandemic has forced companies into that kind of situation, and it's not time to stop doing that. I think you've got to continue with that discipline. And I, I think you can run several scenarios now. So maybe it may be time to dust off an optimistic scenario and, and figure out what kind of decisions need to be made if you're trending towards, you know, a V-shaped recovery versus a flat or a U-shaped recovery. And I think it'll be different for each company and each vertical. And so, you know, when I say scenarios, maybe now's the time to dust off a, you know, I've got my, uh, I've got my trough and my baseline now after three months of this, maybe it's time to look at an upside and maybe an optimistic scenario and each one will drive different decisions. So thinking about what those decisions would be ahead of time as it, as it, uh, as it relates to capital and expenditures, as it relates to maybe rehiring, uh, as it relates to you know, maybe dealing with tough decisions you've put off. Maybe you've got to make some, some uh, more employee rationalization and maybe there's some, some downsizing in front of you. All of those decisions can be, can be well thought out and tied to a, a, a forecast in terms of a scenario plan off a baseline that that you probably can start to think about now. Great. And so we also know, I mean, it's not just it's not just companies and businesses who have taken a hit during during the pandemic. It's also affected individuals. Um, the the volatility of the market has greatly impacted some people. Deborah, from your perspective, you know, are we looking at a, a 2008, a 1930s situation with the the stock market going forward? Um, and if so, like what, what's next? What, was, what should we be considering? Yes. Well, as you had said earlier, this pandemic has had a number of unprecedented responses um, that were very different, not only from 2008 and its circumstances, but the Spanish flu and, and other occasions where we've had pandemics like Ebola. In this case, um, the immediate in, impact um, on our economy was because of the shutdown due to the pandemic. And there were dramatic impacts by investors' emotions, both at the very beginning, leaving, uh, selling all of their investments and not knowing how to respond to this, as well as through the good news. And in addition to that, we've had some swift responses from our feds propping up our economy 
that's very much unlike what we experienced in 2008. And this morning, Stephen Mnuchin even said not that we're not going to shut down our economy for sure, but we also are going to continue to support economically the restaurants that need some new considerations, the airline industry that needs some new considerations. They are not going to walk away from this from an economic level. In 2008, that was a whole other story. That was some bad decision making on taking mortgages that should not have been written and some complicated securities for those mortgages that uh, took our banks really to the tank, if not out of business. So we're talking about completely different circumstances, but both of them had uncertainty with them. And in this case, um, it may very well be that should we continue to have the spikes that we're, con we're experiencing right now, or should we get to regrettably and hopefully not, but should we get beyond the R6 that Dr. Gottlieb talks about being epidemic proportions at R7, 8, 9, and 10, we could see another decline. So far, our investors have been operating from emotion and optimism. Every time there's great news from um, remdesivir or vaccines that um, potentially could come out in 2020, there's excitement and the market has surged. But for those who follow the market today, we're down 1,500 points. And that volatility, we think, could continue, including um, perhaps um, some return, you know, a W as we saw in 2008. The expectation is that it's going to take longer to put people to work. Although we had great news that got the market excited last week, um, there's still 30% more people um, not working than during the Great Depression. It will require manufacturing companies and airlines and hospitals providing. Um, surgeries that are elective for a number of our folks who have not been furloughed to return to work. Then the question becomes, what about those 20% of employees who more than likely won't be able to go back to their original jobs because efficiencies have been learned and, oper and businesses realize they can operate with fewer employees than they previously had. So, um, we see, and I think Ross alluded to this as well, that there's um, some ver some Titan economists who are basically um, prognosticating a few different ways of opening uh, the markets. And what I mean by that is seeing the returns in the markets. And that is the U shape that um, Ross referenced. And there's the and then there's the swoosh shape. So one suggests that Q3 and Q4 are going to be um, very successful for businesses, and then we're going to have a long trod to be able to return to the numbers that we saw previous to March 23rd, and it could take a year or two to get there. And then there are those that speak of the U-shape. We're going into 2021 as well. We have some real positive earnings because of all the return to business. And then that slog goes for another year or so. It's the uncertainty that's controlling the markets. And of course, our abilities to get back to work as each of our colleagues on this call have suggested. It's when will we see a vaccine and when will 700 million people around the globe be able to access that vaccine? How can we travel from country to country if South Africa hasn't gotten the vaccine yet and who will get it first? And it's how can we return to our offices so confidently that one of our colleagues won't be coming in because we've all been vaccinated? That's the probable long duration uh, before we return to the numbers that we saw before March. But then there's a lot of growth and optimism forecasted. Great. It sounds one of the common themes that you know we're hearing from you know a business side and from even a personal side it it seems like the ability to be agile and the ability to pivot um has been important especially in seeing how successful businesses have done this brian you and i have talked um 
you know, in preparation for this about the way Aldridge was able to move their entire company remote while servicing your clients too. Can you talk a little more about what companies should look for in terms of making sure the vendors they use are agile and able to able to work with them and pivot with them in times of uncertainty? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, when we talk when we talk about aligning vendors and clients together, you really want you want a vendor that you're working with that operates similar to the way you operate or operates at a level higher than you operate to help guide you in the direction that you want to go and really encourage folks to take a look at the vendors that they're working with to make sure that they, they've got the appropriate plans in place to to be able to pivot and, and be there when they need them. Uh, we, we went through three of the busiest months on record for the organizations of new incoming service requests and it came at a very interesting time because we were right in the middle of a reorg on how we were going to deliver service to our clients and it really we we made the decision to just expedite it and go and we implemented a scheduling software and all, all this right in the middle of picking up all of our employees sending them home for god knows how long and then at the same time taking that influx of service requests and kudos to our team they really muscled through that and, and delivered um but it, it really put the investment that we had in our business continuity solution to the test. And we, we published that, we, we make that known as to what we're going to do in scenarios and we really build our scenarios around what happens during a hurricane or what happens during a flood. Um, but luckily, the, the systems that we put in place kind of pivoted from being a business continuity solution to a business as usual solution. And we, we continued with that that operation for quite some time. And so I, I think just making sure that folks are, are aligning the way they select their vendors with what they would expect out of their own organization and making sure that those things are balanced are, is, is the biggest rule of thumb there. Great. Ross, I had a, a question for you about leadership in times of, in times of crisis. Um, you know, you work with a lot of different companies. Can you share some examples of what good leadership looks like and how that helps us transition and helps employees feel comfortable when things aren't the way they've always been? You know, I, I would say uh, it starts with very clear communication and it starts with um, um, frequent, I think even more frequent communication in times of uncertainty, uh, in times of, of stress. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think what I've seen in, in what I would call very obvious good leadership and maybe not is, you know, a willingness to put themselves out there with a clear vision and a clear plan and communicating it and making sure the organization uh, uh, is all on the same page. Uh, you know, again, I think I touched on some companies were positively impacted by the pandemic. Obviously, most uh, weren't and some were, were very much you know, devastated. And I think I think those that were negatively impacted, I think, from a leadership perspective, employees and team members and customers and vendors, partners, investors, were all looking to leadership for that, that clear vision, that clear direction. And when it was time to make a tough decision, uh, you know, whether it was furlough or reduction in force or you know, what, what cost reduction, um, you know, being, being uh, upfront and, and communicative about the plan. And um, you know, I would say, you know, just being consistent with the frequency of communication. Uh, you know, I'll speak to Bridgepoint. You know, when this hit our firm, uh, the principles that, that manage, manage our company were pulling from the 2008 playbook. And our playbook was, you know, more frequent meetings, a very clear communication. And, you know, the last thing we're going to do is furlough or riff. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see what we can do to, to come out of this stronger. And and so uh, we were meeting more often during the week. We, we were communicating to the organization uh, at least on a weekly basis through virtual uh, prepared videos or virtual um, webinars like this. And, uh, you know, I think just, just having that clear, concise vision direction and, 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 and communicating frequently is a key uh, during times of uncertainty. Right. Chris, I would be interested to get your perspective on this as well. Uh, you know, a couple of things come to mind is is one, as Ross pointed out, kind of communication. But I think there needs to be a level of candidness or honesty, uh, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. I think 
Um, you know, we're, we're all adults and, and, you know, without knowing what's going on or uh, there's too much of a rah, rah, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think people think some of that is a, is a bit shallow. Um, and I, I think a level of honesty with, with your organization, your employees is, is really important. I think it's also uh, okay, uh, particularly as things were changing so rapidly to say, for leaders to say, we don't know, uh, but give confidence that we've armed ourselves with experts and their colleagues are, you know, putting together plans uh, or that you've employed resources uh, from outside the organization for guidance. Um, you know, you can't be rudderless, uh, but I think, you know, a, a allowing a level of, of healthy honesty is, is important. I also think that it's important for leadership to pivot. Um, you know, if you're inflexible and you're, you're not being empathetic to not just the conditions in the marketplace, but what's going on with your employees, um, within reason, obviously, but, you know, the, the ability to, to offer flexible shifts and accommodating schedules. Uh, I think we've learned a lot about our, our, our employees. And if we're not utilizing that intimate understanding, uh, then there could be a, you know, a, a lack of support for leadership. Great. Elaine, I have a question you know, kind of shifting from leadership to thinking about employees, and I certainly don't want to to be political with this question, but there are a lot of strong feelings. We've seen this in the media recently. Um, so I'll ask it from a personal perspective. As a business owner, if I've decided that it makes me feel comfortable and makes me feel safer to have my employees wear masks in the office, but people have strong feelings about wearing masks, what 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 is the right thing to do here? And do I have a right to ask that of my employees? Now, that's such an important question right now because it's the, it, you've got people on the one side who feel very offended by have, being asked to wear masks for all sorts of reasons. And you have a lot of people who feel like um, if you don't wear a mask, you are trying to make me sick. <laughs> so you've got a real swing here of belief really heartfelt beliefs that are um you know something that's that's trying in dealing with either on a customer basis and that's you know there's a little bit of a different response there but also on an employee basis so from an employment lawyer perspective if you as the employer want to require people to engage in social distancing wash their hands use hand sanitizer wear a mask during some or, or all of, of them being in the office, not share mugs in the kitchen, you have a right as an employer to impose those rules on your employees and request that when they're effectively clocked in and doing work, they comply with your requirements. And if they refuse to for deeply held personal reasons or beliefs, um, you can discipline them up to and including termination. Now, there are a few, you know, maybe someone doesn't want to wear a mask because they have an asthma diagnosis. You know, there are some times you need to talk to the people, understand what their reasons are, and there may be some protections allowed to them under the law. But if someone just says, I have a constitutional right, I'm not going to wear a mask, and your employment policy is you need to wear a mask if you're walking around the common areas, that person does not have a constitutional right not to wear a mask when they are reporting to you as their employer and you are requiring them to comply with company policies. I will say it's the same thing for customers. The example I've been given a lot is, you know, no shoes, no shirt, no service. You don't expect to walk into a restaurant as a man, you know, with your shirt off and, you know, get served or without shoes. Um, nice restaurants require you to wear a jacket. If you don't wear a jacket, then they're not going to seat you. It's the same thing with the mask. If you walk into a Starbucks or a Costco or an HEB and they say, please wear a mask, they have a right to say, we would like our customers. It's private property. And it's the same in your work environment. So as you're reopening, it's important to figure out for your, for your customers, for your vendors, for your contractors, for your guests, what are the requirements going to be for them? Um, you know, you may feel differently about asking clients to wear a mask or sign a release, but there may be other groups of people that you want to ask that. 
And it, you know, that's somewhat of a judgment call. That's a risk analysis and, and you know, compliance with your own research or with legal consultation. But, you know, I, I, the, the idea that we can't either ask employees or, or visitors on our private property not to do something that we as the employer or owner decide is appropriate based on our own analysis of safety is really not supported by the Texas or United States constitutions. So that's perfect. And I think the no shirt, no shoes, no service example is Correct. perfect and makes it make a lot of sense for a lot of people there. So thanks for that. So I want to shift, um, you know, looking around the panel and I, you know, and from conversations I've had where it's, you know, we're probably all at different points in our career and our thoughts about retirement and when that may happen. And I imagine many of the people on the call today are there too. Deborah, is, are there things that business leaders need to be thinking about doing differently with their retirement planning at this point um, because of COVID and because of the last few months? Well, the very fact that you said business leaders, I think, points to some opportunity. And the first I would suggest is business leaders today need to be looking at the cost efficiencies, as Ross was pointing out, looking at their cash flow and all their other expenditures. So there are many um, opportunities when you have a 401k or other forms of retirement plans where you can shave off a little bit of expense and worthwhile expense enough to be able to return that to the investors and the plans. And it just depends on the chassis that the plan is built on as well as the kinds of investments within the portfolios available to the employees. So taking a second look at your retirement plan, be it a 401k or simple or an SEP, would give you an opportunity to maybe add some enhancements while you're evaluating all of your other productivity. The other thing I would say is there are opportunities today when uh, employers and business leaders are creating very, very cost efficient plans to do something that's called self-directed 401ks, where you're still within the 401k, but you're actually allowing your employees and yourself to do some um, investing on the outside of that plan. Doesn't mean that it's more cost, it just means that rather than the plate of uh, selections that you've got there, if you will, you can go outside the plan while still being in your plan to choose some other creative investments. And that's something that we've done in particular for folks that are in the oil and gas industry because they're so heavily weighted with their um, stock portfolios of their companies and want to reduce that a bit. So we make available for them um, other options in addition to maybe their index funds. The final thing that I would say, and I say this to both business leaders and their employees, is for those that um, haven't checked on their risk tolerance in quite some time, meet with a financial advisor. Talk to someone who is in the investment world and make sure that your uh, selection of your funds is aligned with your risk tolerance. And how we define risk tolerance is, how soon is it until you will need your money? If it's 10 years, if it's 15 years, if it's 20 years, chances are, if you can sleep at night, many can, you don't need to moderate your portfolio unless your emotion says so uh, in a situation like this. Because as we've all seen, until the last couple, three days, the market returned to where it was in March, and it will again. But if your retirement is in three to five years, and you'll need that money then, you should have already been moderating your portfolio, and now is another opportunity to have a conversation about it. At least have a conversation. Thank you. So we have uh, we only have about eight minutes left. It's amazing how fast the time has gone by. Uh, with this great information. So I want to get to a few questions from um, from the attendees. So if you could try to answer these as briefly as possible so we can get through as many. Brian, I've got the first one for you um, here. 
you know, how do people adjust their business continuity plans moving forward when, you know, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, when we're planning for the unexpected? Yeah, I, I used the phrase earlier that business continuity plans have kind of shifted to business as usual. We we before looked at how do we how do we position ourselves so that if a hurricane's coming, we can shift and we can access the critical information we need for a short period of time in a different fashion. And now we want to work through how do we make our employees be able to work from any device anywhere and have a similar experience as they do in the office, whether they're at home, they're on vacation, whatever that is. Um, luckily, technology now is cheaper than ever when it comes to these types of solutions. So Office 365, just as an example, has enabled businesses to leverage pieces of it like SharePoint that took the place of historical file servers that we had in place. So just looking at individual pieces of technology like that really shifts the conversation from a business continuity solution to just the technology that you use to run your office and then minimizes that need that you have on that business continuity solution because as long as you've got connection to the internet, you, you can work the same anywhere. Great, um, and it's fitting that you said business as usual because uh, the question here is, and I'll, I'll kick this over to Ross, how do we balance employee safety and business as usual moving forward? You know, that's a great question. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, as we think about it at Bridgepoint and, and we had lots of conversation with our clients, um, you know, I, I think you have to respect uh, the individual more than, than maybe you have in the past. When I say that, you know, uh, this is a storm that we've lived through and some people have looked at it as a, a annoying, annoying uh, little drizzle and I've gone out and I've gotten wet, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not in the at risk group. So it's been an annoyance. I, I, I've, uh, I've dealt with it. Uh, others, it's been, you know, thunder and lightning. They've, they've adhered to the lockdown. They've stayed inside. Uh, you know, they've gotten groceries delivered to their house. And, and for others, it's just been a hurricane. You know, maybe they have underlying health issues. They, uh, they uh, uh, maybe in, in an elderly, you know, 70, 80, 80 year old range or more. Uh, they have stayed locked down. They've quarantined. They haven't seen people in months. Uh, and as we go back to work and we and we look at our workforce, I think we have to recognize that each person is going to view coming back to work on a very individual basis. So you really have to put policies and structure in place that make those folks feel safe, no matter where they are on the spectrum. And in some cases, it might be being flexible enough to let them continue to work from home. Uh, you know, I think if you have the ability to to make return to office voluntary, I think you should consider that. Uh, if you don't, if you run a manufacturing operation and you need people out there making your product, if you run a restaurant and you need cooks back in the kitchen, then I think, you know, doing what Elaine suggested and putting policies in place that enforce wearing a mask and uh, very frequent sanitation, uh, sanit sanitization, uh, you know, maybe if you have to accept visitors at your office, implementing a log with a temperature check at the door uh, is, is needed. So. You know, I just think being aware that uh, employee safety is got to be a consideration, has to be a consideration, and balancing that at the individual level uh, with your company's goals and objectives is very, very important. And I think it goes back to leadership. It goes back to the empathy. I think Chris mentioned when he talked about leadership. I think by doing that with employees and customers and folks that are coming back to your operation, you know, I think is a, is a good demonstration, a demonstration of good leadership. Perfect. And I'm going to try to get in three quick questions really quickly. Chris, what, what are some employee behaviors or employer behaviors that we might need to revisit? Um, you know, I, I think we've learned a lot in, in this time and, and uh, it's not so much about business acumen that employees may have, but really their ability to, to work autonomously and or remote, but more importantly, kind of their coping skills. Uh, I think one of the more positive things that have come out of this is just we've learned about our employees on more of a personal level, homes, spouses, kids, schools, whether or not they can support a, you know, two to three Zoom meetings going simultaneously. Uh, but it allows us to kind of look from a different lens on past behaviors and maybe philosophies that, that need to change. I think, you know, Elaine mentioned it earlier, but I think the whole stigma around I'm working from home, you know, that had a different connotation four months ago. Uh, I know in my world on the sales side, all of my colleagues would roll their eyes or whatnot, but 
there's a legitimacy there and there shouldn't be any shame uh, with somebody saying that I'm, I'm working from home um, if there are measures in place that can make sure that work is getting done. I, I also think that there's gonna be a lot of class A real estate available uh, in the next 12 to 18 months as people start looking into their square foot cost and the lower cost of delivering goods and services to their employees. Um, but I also think that mentality of in order to be successful, we have to be in the office is being challenged. Now that's not for all, right? Because we've also seen where some individuals need to be in the office uh, or have struggled from being at home. But um, I think if people have proven themselves capable, they should be able to. Uh, which speaks to kind of performance management. One of the things that we have already seen in advance of COVID and we're seeing a lot more of now is the movement away from kind of online matrices doing performance evaluations and much more of performance conversations. This has really forced us to talk to our employees and have conversations. Uh, and I think that you get a whole lot more out of that and as a business moving forward, uh, you can further yourselves versus just a list of kind of pre-qualified or, or pre-populated dropdowns. Uh, so I think those are some of the things that, uh, that are immediately being forecasted uh, in, in kind of the shift in behaviors. Good. Okay, perfect. And oh, go ahead. Well, I'm going to jump in with one last question. Um, for Deborah, really quick, because I think this is something people can take away. Um, are there any investment strategies or anything that you can recommend that people can take advantage of now in this uncertain time? Absolutely. We're doing some really nifty things. One of the things that we're doing is uh, working with a pool of franchise restaurants that are in the quick service restaurant industry. And the reason that is, is they're pretty much recession proof and have proven during recessions to make more money when their ticket items are two to $10. So without getting into too much description, it's a really nice opportunity to receive income and eventual appreciation during a time that may be, you know, an extended recession for a while. We've also put together some theme portfolios. One is based on social distancing and that of course anticipates the opening and has um, enjoyed the earnings from the last few weeks, anticipates the openings in restaurants and cruise lines and airlines and many, many other kinds of um, stocks. And, and finally, we're looking at company, we uh, have put together a pool of companies that are down 40, 50% from their earnings um, back in March and through the previous years. And they faltered only because of the shutdown. So these opportunities are quite volatile, of course, because there is so much uncertainty out there. But these are just three ideas of what we're doing to take advantage while the market is still significantly behind and has a lot of room for return over the next couple of years. This is great. And I appreciate all of the insight. And I think one of the things that we can take from this is that you know, we, we realize we've got five, five experts on here and the questions that we weren't able to get to today, as I mentioned, the panelists have graciously agreed to follow up with answers to those questions. And again, there will be a post event survey. If you could just take two to three minutes to fill that out, um, you'll have an opportunity on the survey to also say, I would like to speak further with Deborah, with Brian, with Elaine, and with any of our panelists so that they can answer any questions that you have about the things that they do and the ways that they can help your business. Um, and again, by taking that survey, you're also entering yourself for a chance to win a bottle of wine. Um, mm -hmm. So I know I'll be, uh, I'll be filling out that survey. So you're competing with me for that one, but I don't have a leg up just because I moderated. But we appreciate everybody's time today. Um, we appreciate the panelists. If we were in person, we would give them a round of applause, but virtually we'll do that from here. And thank you guys and have a great day.